Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep. Welcome to another session in our explained series where today we shall be talking about the portion of environment and ecology. So recently, that is in this week, a landmark agreement was reached upon by various different countries of United Nations under the aegis of Convention to Biodiversity and that particular agreement which was referred to as the Kunming Montreal Agreement is something that we are going to look at. Now this Kunmin Montreal agreement is considered to be a landmark agreement when it comes to the issue of conservation of biodiversity. Many of the scholars, many of the researchers, they are even equating it to be at par with the Paris deal which was reached in terms of combating the impacts of climate change. So that is what makes this deal very important. Overall, in this deal, various different countries and members, they have come together to finalize a set of 23 targets, a set of certain goals, so as to lead the world into this next decade, whereby the conservation of biodiversity shall be possible. So in this particular session, we shall be analyzing what this agreement is. Why is it that we are looking into it? Where and under what conditions have this deal be signed? Why it is named as the Kunming Montreal Agreement? What are the intricacies, the targets, the goal setting which has been done? What do we mean by Conference of Parties and the Convention on Biological Diversity? What are the challenges which are posed by this deal? What are the issues which this deal confronts going ahead into the future? and also what has been the India's stand when it comes to this particular agreement. So all these factors is something that we shall be dealing with in significant detail because this is a topic which becomes very relevant and very important for the civil services examination both for your prelims as well as for your mains exam. Oftentimes, UPSC has been found to be asking direct questions from these types of agreements and these types of deals which have been reached in terms of conservation of nature and balancing the natural demands. So without further ado, let us initiate our discussion and first of all, let us address few of the basic factors here. Now, the first factor that we are going to address here is the what, when and where of it. So basically, what is this deal that everybody is talking about? Why is it being celebrated? So, in the 15th Conference of Parties to the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, which was being held in Montreal in the second week of December, there you had the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, which was adopted by various different countries of the world under the ages of United Nations. Now, that is why this deal is named as such. Now, what do we understand by the various terminologies used here? For example, what is Conference of Parties? When we talk about COP, what do we understand by Conference of Parties? Recently, you would have come across the news articles about COP27, which was held in Egypt in order to combat climate change. Is it very similar or is it something different? And what do we understand by United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity? So let us address these first. So basically, when we talk about UN Convention on Biological Diversity, that is one of the conventions which was finalized in 1992 Earth Summit. And since that point of time, every couple of years, you have the apex body meeting of this convention where the heads of states oftentimes or the leading delegations and the ministers, they meet under the aegis of conference of parties. Every two years, there is a COP which is held. Now, this conference of parties, this meeting was supposed to be held in Kunming in China. This was supposed to be held in Kunming, in China. When? It was supposed to be held in the year 2020. But we all know, 2020 was the year of the pandemic. Lot of unexpected things were thrown up before the world. And obviously, meetings and conventions were last to the issues that the world faced. So that is when this conference of party was pushed forward to 2021. And 
in the later part of 2021, you had a virtual meeting with many of the members, 100 plus member countries attended that virtual meeting and that meeting was hosted from Kunming. Now there, close to around 20 plus targets were decided to be finalized and it was also decided that the second part of this meeting will be held in Montreal in December 2022. So over the past couple of years, intense negotiations have been happening and all the various different countries have been trying to pitch in when it comes to the process of conservation. Now this conference of parties, that is why this is referred to as COP15 because it is the 15th meeting of the conference of parties for convention on biological diversity and that is why it is named as Kunming Montreal agreement. Why? Because part of this meeting was held in Kunming and final signing and decision making was done at Montreal in the last 10 days. Now this is about the when and where. Now here what is it and what is the need for it? So basically under this meeting a global biodiversity framework that was finalized. Overall, this convention on biological diversity, the countries under this convention have been trying really hard to chart forward a kind of a pathway which the world can follow so that they are able to achieve a goal of 2050, which is living in harmony with nature. That is the goal that the world has in front of its eyes, that is living in harmony with nature okay now this particular deal is considered to be a landmark because it ends up deciding the course and the path to be followed for the next decade now what do we understand by this convention on biological diversity when was it set up what is its funding agency let us understand that so basically when we talk about CBD that is the Convention on Biological Diversity or simply referred to as the Biodiversity Convention. This was set up and established due to and during the procedures of the Earth Summit which was conducted in 1992 in Brazil in the town of Rio de Janeiro. Now this Earth Summit is particularly important when it comes to conservation, when it comes to combating against climate change and overall natural conservation. Now, at this particular Earth Summit of 1992, you had three major documents and three major conventions which were finalized. Amongst the documents, you had Agenda 21 and so on. But when we talk about the important conventions which were finalized, which were signed during this summit, they were UNFCCC, that is United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Then you had UNCCD that is United Nation Convention to Combat Desertification and also UNCBD that is this was for combating climate change okay United Nation Framework Convention on Climate Change this was to combat desertification And then when we talk about CBD, this is for biological diversity. Biological diversity. So recently, that is in the past month, you would have heard about COP27 or COP27, which was held in Egypt and landmark deals were reached in order to combat climate change. So that COP27 that you heard about, that dealt with UNFCCC. This particular COP15 that we are discussing, that is under the aegis of UNCBD. Now, whenever you hear about the term COP or Conference of Parties, please always understand, for any convention, a Conference of Parties is the highest decision-making body. This is the highest decision-making body for any convention. Okay, it is not the Secretariat, it is not the Ministerial Meet, it is the 
conference of parties okay now for various different conventions for example for climate change the conference of parties is held annually whereas in this case it is held every two years it started way back with the first conference of parties being held in Bahamas and since that point of time the conservation on biological diversity has held its meeting at various parts of the globe now here one question begs our attention and that is has India ever hosted a conference of parties for CBD the answer is yes it was in 2012 when India hosted a conference of party convention on biological diversity which was held in Hyderabad so that also becomes relevant for your prelims question and an objective prelims pointer that is what and where it will find its importance now here all these different conventions they are signed and they are brought about in order to bring some amount of change in the way that we deal with environment that way that we deal with the nature so that is why all these different conventions they have their funding mechanism under which the countries in need when they have to achieve a target when they have to fulfill a goal they are provided with some sort of funding mechanism at least they are supposed to be provided so the funding mechanism for all these three conventions and for many more is actually supported by GEF that is global environment facility that is what deals with the funding mechanism funding for conventions now the problem with GEF which has come to light in the past few years is the fact that GEF has not been very open in terms of adopting various different programs, various different measures which can protect con conservation measures or initiate conservation measures, particularly in the least developing nations and the developing nations of the world. So that is why majority of the developing nations and underdeveloped nations, they have had a major grievance with regards to the funding mechanism of GEF. It is in fact alleged that when the funding is required, there is a lot of bureaucratic setup which needs to be fulfilled. Only after that, depending upon the discretion of GEF, you will get funding for any particular activity or you might not get so. So this was a grievance that many different countries, they have been harboring for a long period of time. So when the countries they sat to finalize the deal of COP15 for Convention on Biological Diversity, this was one of the major issues that all the countries ended up raising. Now here, when we talk about Convention on Biological Diversity, the aim is very simple, to conserve the biological resource that we have across the planet. To bring to a halt the extinction of species that we are witnessing in front of our very eyes. So very quickly let us take a look at the brief background of this convention. So when we talk about the goals of this convention, the goals are very lofty and at the same time very comprehensive. One of the goals is conservation of biological diversity, the very basic requirement. Then you have sustainable use of the components of biodiversity understand this sustainable use of the components of biodiversity now here when we talk about biodiversity you have various different components constituents participants in biodiversity you might have certain genetically modified organisms you might have certain genetically modified microbes which are required for experimental purpose so how do we end up using them without damaging the existent biodiversity setup that we have that is a goal because many of the times the genetically modified crops for example when they are introduced in a certain area that is when they end up threatening the local population of the plants and the local biodiversity the indigenous biodiversity so that is why the second goal has been set up and the third goal is fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising from the genetic resources so the various genetic resources that you have the benefits that accrue from it should be shared with the local indigenous people as well and that is it where it talks about making the local population a participant in this conservation effort
because once you make the local population a participant in conservation the effort of conservation is much more sustainable and much more organic there you don't have to push certain measures it is naturally forthcoming from the population now CBD under itself did not have enough mechanisms to be able to fulfill all its goals so over a period of time CBD has basically come up with various different additional protocols so that these goals are reinforced and are implemented for example it was in the year 2000 when you had a conference of parties which was held at Cartagena in Colombia Cartagena in Colombia now there what was finalized was referred to as the Cartagena protocol now this Cartagena protocol that you have this is also referred to as the Cartagena protocol on biosafety now this protocol was chiefly and primarily finalized for sustainable use of the components of biodiversity particularly so when it comes to LMOs that is living modified organisms which in a simpler terms refers to genetically modified organisms living modified organisms here whenever you want to introduce a genetically modified crop in a particular country you have to take clearance from the biosafety clearing house which is set up and thereby only after that can you introduce a modified organism so that the local biodiversity and the impact on the local biodiversity is adequately weighed in now after that again the procedure continued and it was again the third goal which needed a kind of a fulfillment and needed a kind of an assurance that is where in 2010 you had another protocol which was finalized and that was the Nagoya protocol Nagoya protocol which was finalized in Japan whereby by the year 2010 it was realized that the threat to biodiversity is ever increasing and the efforts which are being carried out are not significant enough and there in Nagoya protocol you had a declaration of a set of 20 goals which the world was set to achieve by the year 2020 now these 20 goals which the world was set before itself that was referred to as the HE targets which was finalized here he targets to be achieved by the year 2020 now it was in this Nagoya protocol where fundamentals and basic structure regarding the fair and equitable sharing of access benefit that is something which was ensured here but furthermore the world also got a pathway with regards to how to proceed ahead what to do in order to conserve biodiversity by the time of 2020 and there under the HE targets you had 20 goals under five strategic divisions so the world had got its path under this measure United Nations also declared the decade between 2011 to 2020 as the decade for conservation of biodiversity but what after 2020 so that is where the deliberation has been going on for some time now what do we do after 2020 and this seriousness was actually realized in the conference of party 14 meeting COP 14 meeting for CBD which was held where this was held in 2018 in Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt that is where it was realized that we need to come up with a pathway to finalize and chart out a course that the world will follow beyond 2020 but then 2020 came COVID came in and these goals could not be finalized these goals were finalized in the last 10 days 
that is what makes it very instrumental now you will be able to understand why the entire world is actually celebrating this agreement and celebrating this landmark measure now let us understand this agreement in slightly greater detail let us try to understand the goals and the targets that this agreement has and certain special mechanisms which have been introduced for the first time under this agreement so when we talk about what is this agreement here it is convened under the ages of United Nations chaired by China and hosted by Canada, the 15th COP to the UN Convention on Biological Diversity adopted the Global Biodiversity Framework or GBF, including the goals and the targets to be attained by 2030. So here, the long-term goal is what? To attain the conditions by 2050 of living in harmony with nature. The medium term goal is what? By 2030, achieving the targets which have been set under this agreement. And the short term goal is what? To bring the various different stakeholders under one roof and try to ensure a more comprehensive and holistic conservation measure. Now, when we talk about the four goals, the four goals which have been set by this agreement are very simple and straightforward. Now, here, First is a halt in the human induced extinction. Now, we all know that across the planet right now, for the past few centuries, we have been experiencing an extraordinary rate of extinction for various different species. And the specific thing about this extinction which is happening right now is 99% of the species which are getting extinct most of that is human led or human induced overall the planet has already gone through five various different phases of mass extinction but then this human based and human induced extinction that is what is also referred to as the sixth mass extinction now human induced extinction when we talk about what are the various measures by which human led or human induced extinction actually comes to the fore? So basically when we talk about the threats to biodiversity, biodiversity experiences various different threats which end up diminishing their population over a long period of time and eventually pushing them on the verge of extinction. But when we talk about human induced, so when we talk about these threats, they are either loss of habitat where oftentimes we make use of the uh, jungles, the semi-arid areas, etc. that we have. We bring it under cultivation or we carry out infrastructure building activities. So that basically destroys the habitat of biodiversity. Take the case of the hunting cat that we have, that is carousel. Right. Now, if you observe this cat, which is found in very large numbers in the region of Middle East and other Asian nations, India at one point of time also had a significant population of these carousels. But then they were found in the semi-arid areas of the present day Madhya Pradesh and Eastern Rajasthan. Much of that semi-arid region has now been claimed by agriculture and the extension of agricultural services. As a result of that, carousel has lost its natural habitat. And that is where these species are found in very little numbers in India now. Take the case about cheetah. Cheetah reintroduction has garnered all the major news headlines for the past couple of months almost. Now this cheetah reintroduction, why was it required to happen? Because we destroyed their habitat and worse, we hunted them to extinction. So all these factors are human-induced extinction. Also, the amount of pollution that we carry out on a day-to-day -day basis, be it the marine environment, be it the land degradation, all of that is responsible for human-induced extinction. You can take the case of various different species. One of the species which went extinct was a sea cow. And since the time when people got to know about sea cow, it took only around three to four decades where our hunting mechanism and incessant hunting pushed that sea cow to extinction. Then, increasing area of natural ecosystem by 2050. 
that is bringing more areas under restoration the degraded areas under restoration and also increasing the natural habitat by the year 2050 that is one of the goal under goal a maintaining the genetic diversity at various levels including in situ and ex situ conservation measures including in situ and ex situ conservation measures now what do we mean by in situ and ex situ in situ refers to wherever the animal is present in its natural habitat you start a conservation measure in that region itself for example a national park a wildlife sanctuary there whichever animal even though they are threatened or they are vulnerable we protect them conserve them there itself we don't transfer them anywhere ex situ is where you transfer the threatened species vulnerable species to special protected areas or zones in order to ensure conservation for example you have gene banks you have botanical gardens you have zoos in existence all that comes under the example and the ages of ex situ management so by these conservation measures genetic diversity has to be maintained and here when we talk about genetic diversity we have to ensure different types of genetic diversity that is the diversity which exists within the species the functional diversity of the ecosystem which exists and also the diversity which exists between different ecosystems between the various different species amongst themselves so all those kinds of diversity has to be maintained only when a diversity is there in a particular species can their conservation be ensured for example take the case of gear lions gear lions which you find in India that is a breed of Asiatic lions basically now in India we have Asiatic lions which are found in the region of Gujarat near the gear ranges but then that is all that we have and even amongst themselves they don't have much of a genetic diversity they are restricted to a smaller area so the headache and the worry in front of the conservationist is due to lack of this diversity all these lions they are prone to the same kind of diseases they are prone to the same kind of vulnerabilities so if let's suppose there is such a kind of a disease which spreads amongst these lions it can virtually mean the extinction of the entire population in that particular region so that is where government of India for some time now has also been initiating a program for lion reintroduction in various different other parts of the country so as to ensure a kind of a diversity which is maintained. Then in goal B sustainably restoring the ecosystems and this talks about the degraded ecosystems the polluted ecosystems to bring them back to use to ensure that the land degradation that portion is taken care of then other fair and equitable sharing of benefits from genetic resources this is also in order to protect in order to conserve and in order to respect the rights of the indigenous species and the indigenous population which reside in that area because many of the times the conservation efforts oftentimes alienates the local population and what it does is it basically puts up the local population against and in an antagonistic way for the conservation efforts that is where the local population for example in your region let's suppose in your rural area or in any particular uh, such uh, isolated region let's suppose you have a particular medicinal plant which is discovered and that has got immense benefits let's say for the design of cancer drugs now when the various different multinational organizations will come they will exploit that plant and that bio biodiversity resource that we have what is the incentive for the local population to ensure that this process is carried out in a sustainable way that can happen only if you ensure a sharing equitable sharing of benefits for the biodiversity then aligning financial flows with the overall global biodiversity framework and the 2050 vision for biodiversity so these are the major goals now in order to fulfill these goals 
this convention has set a kind of a quantifiable target for itself. Overall, there have been 23 targets which have been set. And these 23 targets, most of them are supposed to be achieved by the year 2030. Now, what makes these targets different from the earlier set targets which you saw in the case of HE target, HE biodiversity target or HE goals, etc. is here you have a quantifiable milestone that the countries have to achieve. Now, all these targets, they are placed under different headings, three major headings. So here, they are placed under the first major heading reducing the threats to biodiversity then meeting people's needs through sustainable use and benefit sharing and then tools and solutions for implementation and mainstreaming of these targets so the first target or the first group of targets under this heading that is very very important the second group it talks about a kind of a fair and sustainable trade sharing the benefits with the local population that we have talked about and the third it talks about certain important aspects such as financing how much financing should be made available who will make the financing available etc so let us analyze few of the important targets which this convention and this agreement has set for itself and for the entire code. Now here, under the first heading that is reducing the threats to biodiversity, you have certain very important targets. First is to bring the loss of areas of high biodiversity importance close to zero by 2030. Now this means that you have various different land uses, various different regions of the world, be it the coastal areas, marine environment or terrestrial regions, which have been suffering significant amount of land use. Now here, in many of the cases, this land use is oftentimes detrimental to the survival and the conservation of biodiversity, especially when it comes to small island nations. Because when we talk about biodiversity in the island regions, that biodiversity is very pristine and at the same time significantly important to be conserved. Because when the animal species or the plant species, they are present in an island of sorts, the evolution path that they follow, that is slightly different when it is found in the terrestrial region of the mainland continents. So it is in these small island regions in particular focus where the loss of land of these critical areas has to be reduced to zero by the year 2030. Then you have the 30 by 30 goal or the 30 by 30 target. Now what is it? Under this you have two mechanisms or the two sub targets. First target is to bring 30% of degraded area degraded area under restoration okay and then another is 30% of terrestrial region marine region coastal area intertidal zones Overall, 30% of the area across the globe, okay, area across the planet to be conserved. To be conserved. Now, both of these have to be achieved by the year 2030. That is when the target year lies. That is why this is also referred to as the 30 by 30 target. This is the most prolific, the most prominent amongst the various target settings which have been done. Then halt human induced extinction, impact of invasive alien species. 
Now we do have certain invasive alien species for example Himalayan balsam for example certain types of rats for example water hyacinth. Now when these invasive alien species they start inhabiting a particular region a particular ecosystem the local biodiversity not only is threatened many of the times it is put out of uh, survival in that region as well. So the aim is to reduce the introduction and the impact of invasive alien species. Reduce it by 50 percent by 2030. So that another, another major threat when it comes to the threat to biodiversity that is taken care of. Then reduce pollution risk. Pollution which is carried out often times by various different types of uh, uh, effluents that we release into the ecosystem including the use of pesticides, insecticides as well as herbicides. So overall the target is to reduce the usage of these pesticides, herbicides and weedicides, insecticides etc. and the other harmful chemicals by almost 50%. So reduce the usage of insecticides etc by 50 percent by 2030 that is another major target then minimize the impact of climate change and ocean acidification which the various different parts of biodiversity experience in different parts of the planet. So that is again one of the major goals. Now other certain goals, certain important prolific goals that you will come across here for the first time a certain set of responsibilities have been accrued to the big companies, to the private players in the arena. Because the realization has been there for a long period of time, unless and until you ensure the participation of the private sector, you cannot ensure sustainable methods and measures of conservation. Because these private sectors, they have big purses, they have big money which they can contribute, which many of the times the governments, they are in a way reluctant to do so. Now here, many of the big companies that operate, they end up carrying out their own methods of destruction of biodiversity either by creating a lot of pollution or by degrading the land in certain regions. Now the monitoring mechanism has been set up whereby regularly large and transnational or multinational companies and financial institutions they have to regularly monitor, assess and transparently disclose their risk and the impacts that their operations have on biodiversity. Also, they now are needed to provide information to the consumers to promote sustainable consumption patterns because you and I also, if we let's say are buying certain goods from the market from a big company, let's say, from a big beverage company. Now, if we come to a realization that the making of this beverage basically means that many of the species they are threatened or they are destroyed much of the land area is destroyed we will be reluctant to buy that product anymore and furthermore the company will also be in a way forced to bring about better practices of production and be more sustainable going ahead so that is where it aims to serve multiple purposes then after that, report on compliance with access and benefit sharing regulations and measures that in any particular region, what is the benefit that these companies are ensuring to the local indigenous population, whether they are benefiting them or not. So this is one of those landmark portions of this particular deal. Then another major portion is the subsidies. Now this has been a point of contention for a long period of time. India in itself does not agree with the subsidies target that this particular agreement has set for the world. Now what is the target? The target is that globally there has to be a concerted effort, a kind of a joint effort to reduce the subsidies provided by the various governments to the various sections of the population 
and these are referred to as harmful subsidies. So, the target is to reduce the harmful subsidies by almost 500 billion dollars every year by the year 2030. So, reduction in harmful subsidies subsidies by US dollar 500 billion annually by 2030. Now amongst these subsidies which have been counted, agricultural subsidy is one of those which this agreement is against. Agricultural subsidy. Now when we talk about agricultural subsidy, particularly in the scenario of India, this becomes very relevant and very important. Because in India, where we have more than 50% of the population still involved in agriculture directly or indirectly, and those not occupying the higher strata of society at the income level, the government does provide significant amount of subsidy in the form of cheaper seeds or the cheaper fertilizers, cheaper insecticides, etc. Now, this has been touted as harmful under this agreement. Now, first of all, let us understand the argument that this agreement and the postulators of this agreement, they have put forward. The argument that they have put forward is, look, you as a government are providing the subsidy. Now, that subsidy is utilized by the farmer to buy a lot of insecticides, a lot of chemical fertilizers, which otherwise, if you would not have provided the subsidy, maybe that farmer would have gone for a natural production mechanism, such as, let's say, manure, etc. Now, because you are providing that subsidy, those materials are available at a very cheap rate for the farmer. Now, the farmer will start applying those in very large quantities on the soil. When you start applying a large quantum and large quantity of these fertilizers, chemical inputs, the microflora and fauna which is present in the soil, they start dying almost immediately. Basically, it is said that even in a teaspoonful of soil, you will find millions of species from microbes to large worms as well. And all of them are very, very important for the survivability of the various different plants that you see and the maintenance of fertility and productivity in the soil. Now, these chemical inputs, they threaten that. That is why here, agricultural subsidy is targeted. But when it comes to developing nations and countries such as India, they have staunchly opposed this target. And that is where India has got a unique opportunity that under this year where India is also the president of G20 grouping, that is where India has got a voice to highlight this issue. Because nonetheless, whatever might be the consequence to it, India as of now is not in a position, not in a state to phase out the agricultural subsidies. Whereas various different countries of the world such as United States, um, countries of European Union, all of them, they in a way are advocating for countries like India to put a ban to these subsidies. That is where a lot of issues they arise even at the platform of World Trade Organization that you would come across in your current affairs. Now, the other important part of it, that is finance. Finance when it comes to conservation measures. So overall, the aim and the target is that by the year 2030, there should be mobilization of at least 20, 200 billion dollars rather every year for the conservation mechanism. Every year 200 billion dollars. Now at the face value of it, it might seem very large. But think about it, that biodiversity is spread and critical biodiversity is spread in various parts of the world. And where, when you talk about these 200 billion dollars, that is spread very thinly. And various different countries in Africa, South America, Asia, even in Asia, the parts of South Asia, Southeast Asia, many of the regions are so vulnerable that you require large sums of money to carry out the process of conservation. But nonetheless, for the first time,
In its history, the Convention on Biological Diversity has come up with a concrete finance plan in order to finance the conservation. Now, this conservation has to come from the financing from various avenues. What are the avenues of financing? International financial assistance, whereby developed nations, they will provide the finances to developing or least developed countries. And that financing will be at the tune of at least $20 billion per year by the year 2025 and at least $30 billion per year by the year 2030. That will and that in itself is supposed to increase incrementally as we move towards closer to 2030. Then also domestic financing is also required because otherwise this particular set and this particular aim of 200 billion dollars seems to be unachievable. So that is where you have to mobilize your domestic resources as well. For example, by national biodiversity finance plans and other various different innovative measures that one can come up with. This also includes leveraging private finance whereby you involve the private players, the private organizations, the private companies to provide finance for the conservation. Also, innovative schemes such as when you utilize certain ecosystem services, thereby payment is required, green bonds, all this also has the capacity to raise significant amount of finance. So all of these included, there has to be a financial mobilization of close to around $200 billion every year. That is significant. Then certain additional features when you talk about this particular agreement these additional features are also very relevant for example various different countries including the least developing nations and the developing nations in itself all of them have requested to set up a special trust fund even though under the aegis of Global Environment Facility or GEF, but they have requested for setting up of a special trust fund to support the funding mechanism. Because as we talked about in the earlier portion, that almost all the various different nations of the world, they are unhappy with the financing mechanism that is operated by GEF. It is controlled by a few and that is where it is very discretionary. Oftentimes, money is not disbursed at all. There is a significant amount of here and there give and take which is involved. Now, this agreement also obligates the countries to monitor and report in every five years or less on the basic headline indicators. Right? What do they have to report? Basic headline indicators. Now, what do we mean by headline indicators? So, for example, what is the land use, how much land has been restored, how much land has been degraded, what amount of coastal land area or coastal region has been restored, the number of species that have been brought back from the brink of extinction and also the reportage when it comes to the private companies operating within these countries. They also have to carry out the monitoring and reporting mechanism. So, that has to be done at least in the five-year interregnum or even less than that. So this is also significant. Another demand which has been set is for setting up of digital inventory. Setting up of digital database on biodiversity. Now, this is again a demand which has been put forward by the least developed nations and few of the developing nations because oftentimes there is an understanding and there is a realization that even though you have a lot of biodiversity, but the utility of it, the utilization, sustainable use of it, the world is not aware of those biological diversity which is present in different areas and that is why you don't have the benefit which is accrued to the local community which they deserve. That is where the aim is that if you set up a digital inventory accessible across the globe, there will be a much more sustained conservation and much more efficient utilization of the biodiversity as well. Now, all this appears to be hunky-dory and absolutely beautiful when it comes to the achievable portion of this agreement. But then, 
there are certain challenges and there are certain criticism which confront this agreement. In fact, it is recorded and it was very significantly important that at the time when this agreement was finalized, you had a representative from the Democratic Republic of Congo who was still voicing his dissent as the final gavel was actually hammered and this agreement was finalized. So this was basically construed as a very important symbol where the demands of the least developed nations and the developing countries, they are being stifled. And everything is being done just to achieve a kind of a PR stunt of sorts that we have finalized this agreement. So let us understand what are the challenges that confront us and what is the criticism that is met out for this particular individual agreement. So the first is the financing issues. The financing issues that we have talked about, it is inefficient under the ages of GEF and secondly, it is spread very thinly. Spread very thin and inadequate. Secondly, the language which has been used has been extremely watered down. It is not so particular in terms of the goal setting as well. Approximately by 30%, about 50% reduction, etc. You don't have a kind of a fixed target setting that is done in many different agreements such as the Paris Agreement, such as the earlier Kyoto Protocol, etc. You had very significantly uh, used language which was very, in a way, unidirectional in terms of the approach that needs to be followed. Here much of the language which is used is very ambiguous and whenever ambiguous language is used oftentimes it is prone to be exploited by the various different interested parties. So there is a criticism regarding the language used and a kind of a vague target setting which has been done. So a kind of a vague target setting. Then there is a kind of an overwhelming criticism which has been floated that this is nothing but an old wine in a new bottle sort of a packaging. Why? Because all the various different goals and the targets that you see, they are significantly and surprisingly similar to the HE targets which the world had set for itself in the year 2010 and 11. So here, Despite the HE targets which the world was supposed to achieve in 2020, I'm sure it won't be a surprise at all to know that none of the countries have been able to achieve those targets, though list of 20 targets that were declared in HE. So basically, now because you had to move to the era of up till 2030, you have simply repackaged all those goals and all those targets. If you analyze the strategic goals under HE biodiversity targets and the goals under the case of this Kunming Montreal agreement, much of that is very, very similar. So the criticism is inadequacy to fulfill the HE targets has basically ensured a repackaging which has been done. Then principle of common but differentiated responsibility. Common but differentiated responsibility. Now what is this? So this is something that you would hear significantly when it comes to combating climate change and measures to be taken in order to adapt to climate change. Whereby the general argument is that look, it is a developed nations which have basically misutilized and have taken the environment to the present state. So they automatically, they have a responsibility to bring in additional amount of resources. Now, India particularly so has stood forward and has put this argument that this principle of CBDR should be applicable even in the case of conservation of biological diversity. And that is where there is an issue. Because under the present target setting and the, under the present agreement, it is being observed and it is being analyzed that the cost of conservation is going to fall disproportionately, if at all, on the underdeveloped and the least developed nations. 
and what do we mean by disproportionate kind of incidence of cost so think about it let's suppose a country such as united states let's suppose united states end ends up spending around 20 billion dollar every year on conservation mechanism but then us has an overall economy surpassing around 17 trillion dollars so for that 20 billion dollar is not significant but think about a country such as democratic republic of congo think about a country such as indonesia or india e india even though and indonesia they are still larger economies but consider the smaller ones even if they end up spending around 2 billion or 3 billion dollar a year that will be disproportionately high in terms of the overall size of the economy that is where the world knows that the cost of conservation is very high for the least developed nations and that is why the principle of cbdr should be adhered to and that is what india's argument was but then this seems to be at risk because of the funding mechanism which has been set up then about reduction of insecticides and the usage of chemical fertilizers herbicides etc now the aim has been set that this has to be reduced by 50 percent by the year 2030 but then what will happen to the food security of the large hungry population that still survives in this world that still manages to survive in this world they don't have access to food our sustainable development goal talks about zero hunger and in that background when you don't have enough food which is produced due to the lack of these chemical inputs who will take care of the food security so that is something which has not been thought about because we have seen what has happened in our neighboring state of sri lanka where once these chemical inputs were suddenly banned what happened thereby the economy collapsed so none of the countries are going to take that risk anymore so how achievable is this target and if this target has to be achieved what will be the alternative to organic farming in terms of economic incentive etc that has not been thought out properly as of yet then the subsidies as we have told already has been a sticking point between countries like india and the other developing nations least developed nations and the developed part of the world now in this background what should be the way forward so regardless of whatever criticism that you throw at this theory and this agreement you have to appreciate this is a much needed step which has been provided as a pathway to the world going ahead into the next decade many different modalities have been finalized but yes as is the case with majority of the agreements significant work needs to be done so by the time that the next conference of party that is cop 16 that will be held where this is also relevant that will be held in turkey right so by that time these modalities these contentions regarding the special body special organization for funding etc that needs to be meted out only then can we have the countries which are actually a large stakeholders in conservation mechanism those countries can actually play their role otherwise this will be just like any other part of or any other global deal which has been reached where you have few decision makers and the rest of them are simply decision followers and eventually after one point of time they simply stop caring for those decisions anymore so if this deal has to be successful if this agreement has to be successful then overall you need to bring these stakeholders on board so that is all that you have to know about this particular agreement in significant detail and this much amount of information will be more than sufficient to address any queries be it asked in the prelims or in the mains examination overall for the examination perspective you should be aware of what this cbd is because oftentimes it has been found that whenever a particular agreement for any convention is asked upsc asks you questions for that convention and the basic principles of that convention so make sure that you are comfortable with this cbd when it was it founded what is the funding mechanism what are the principles involved what are the goals involved and also the goals and the target setting and the issues that developing nations and india overall faces 
So that will be all from my side. Hope that this was a meaningful session for you. So till we see you again, goodbye, take care of yourself. Thank you and good night.